This is Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. Uh, we take a look into uh, PwC's uh, Global Culture Survey of 2021. Um, it highlights what leaders and employees think about the role of uh, organisational culture during the pandemic and what organisations can do actively to manage such cultures um, and it can bring about some whether or not it can bring about some competitive edge. Um, and of course, uh, joining us uh, for today is Jasmine Peters, Director and Experience Consulting Lead of PwC Malaysia. Jasmine, let's, uh, before we jump into the uh, report, let's do a quick take into how uh, you think businesses are doing right now, uh, not just in Malaysia, uh, but across the world. Uh, are businesses recovering uh, from the pandemic or um, you know, are we going through a very tough time and we're going to be prepared for, or we have to be prepared for a much trying time uh, in the near future? Thanks, Ibrahim. I think uh, globally we are seeing many different patterns and it depends on uh, which industry we are looking at. Some industries have actually thrived, yeah? especially I think even in the global manufacturing industry, we are seeing a massive growth. There are industries that have uh, plateaued and have taken a lull uh, and some sadly have dipped. As we move forward, if you ask me, Ibrahim, what we will see, I think if organizations use this time wisely to actually take stock, uh, to be able to reassess uh, and to relook at how they want to position themselves going forward, then this is the time where we can actually see what we can actually do in terms of uh, what is our purpose going to be, whether we want to pivot our business models, whether we want to actually shrink, but then it also means giving it more focus. If this is the way we are approaching it, I think uh, we will be successful regardless of where we stand today. But there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, the future, we would like to say, is optimistic, right? And it is bright for us nonetheless. But there are challenges because uh, we are still in the midst of a lot of uncertainty in terms of how we will come back. That's a little bit of a take in terms of, I think, what uh, globally and even locally we are seeing, Brian. Uh, does the current environment help or hinder uh, such recovery efforts? I think the current environment in a lot of ways has thrown many curveballs, not just one, right? A couple of curveballs is what we see. But will the current environment, has the current environment actually hindered that? Or is it actually giving us an opportunity? I think it's again perspective. There is a lot of opportunity and the opportunity, as I said earlier, is for us to actually retake what we want to be uh, and how we want to position ourselves. It's a good time for us to relook at our sense of purpose as an organization, uh, holistically, in terms of what we offer as an organization to the people that we do business with and the communities that we serve, and also in terms of what is our purpose for our people, the organization, the people that work for the organization that we are. So I think this is the opportunity uh, that this whole pandemic situation has given us as organizations to relook. And within that sphere of things, culture has become a very strong a pivotal indicator of how we can move forward and appreciating how strong our culture is or some of the key aspects of strength within our culture and focusing on what those strengths are will be able to give us some leverage as we move forward. Um, Jasmine, how do you think organizations can realistically measure the effectiveness of um, their culture um, when many of these organizations can't even see their employees? And I'm not talking about you know, for the past few months, uh, some organizations have not seen their uh, employees and their colleagues for, you know, close to two years now. So how do you effectively measure this? That's a very good question. And um, I think if we want to realistically measure the effectiveness, right, of our, our organization today in terms of looking at how our culture and our people are actually faring, we have to ask the real questions. We were very familiar in the past where we, you know, we focus very much on business imperatives and, you know, this is then cascaded down, uh, you know, to the organization in terms of KPIs. And we feel that the organization will tag along and the culture will move along. And in that process, what we usually do is we churn out employee satisfaction surveys or we churn out engagement surveys, feedback sessions, or we do pulse feedback. Now, the thing is, all of that also we have done. Uh, without actually connecting right so we've used some level of hybrid when we even do that in the past so now more than ever that we actually can't see each other and as you rightfully said we haven't seen each other for close to two years now it will be very important that when we do pull this feedback or we ask for this kind of uh, surveys to be done that we actually read what the information is actually telling us and this is something very interesting what we see is that um 
when we pull employer satisfaction surveys, we see the uh, statistics that come back to us and we very quickly put it in frame so that we're able to identify where the issues or the concerns are. But when we look at the verbatims of the survey, very often there is a mismatch between what the uh, statistics are telling us and what the actual verbatims are telling us. You will find that within the verbatims, you will find there's a lot more um, indication that is there's a lot more happening within the organization. So usually it's a little bit more clinical when we ask the larger questions when they pull a four point survey or five point survey. So when you read the verbatims, you see that it may not be as good. And again, Ibrahim, in our Malaysian culture, our DNA is to be very gracious uh, in, when we give feedback. You know, we are usually a lot more pleasant when we give feedback and we tend to round the feedback upwards, right? So statistically, things look good. But when you actually try and understand it a little further, you will find that there are a lot of issues. So here again, what organizations need to really do, if you are really interested to see what the feedback is, we've got to be prepared to ask the hard questions. Now, within our PwC Global Culture Survey that we pulled uh, globally this year, and also within the Malaysian Cut, we're seeing that there's a lot of mismatch between what management thinks it is doing and what the perspective and outlook of the culture is against that of the employee. 75% of senior management really feel that they are actually walking the talk, that they're the embodiment of the organization's culture. But sadly, in response to that percentage, we're only seeing 52% of employees who actually agree that that is what it is. And we're seeing this as the diversity, equity, uh, and uh, inclusion indicators that's where the biggest issues are. So there's an issue of authenticity that we see. So I think if organizations really want to understand what is really going on, we have to ask the real questions and we've got to be prepared to action. Now, I think the, fight, the moment we all went into virtual work environments and virtual mode, many surveys were being going, have been going out, whether short or long, you know, uh, the annual surveys or the periodic. And then there's a fatigue on, on the, our people as well, right? So there's a feedback fatigue. But what the important thing is, if we ask all these questions, what is our call to action? And that's where it makes a huge difference. If we pull the surveys, are we ready to take action on some of the more critical aspects of what the information is that's coming back to us? And that will be something organizations will need to do over and above pushing out a survey is to have the conversations, is to be authentic in asking the real questions. And even if the response to those questions are going to be not favorable in the sense that, uh, for example, like if people say they would like to have more income and we can't do that for many reasons, as we can clearly understand the organizations, we are all being challenged with that area as well. Then I think there needs to be an explanation as to why that can't be, for one. And then to also look at other areas of how we can give people rewards and recognition over and above the finances. So that's the thing I think if you want to say that if you realistically want to uh, take in a have an, if, the view of what's really being effective in the organization, all the surveys, that's great. Uh, the thing about the pandemic is that it has given rise to um, what we call an informal economy. Uh, gig employment and freelance work is getting increasingly popular. Um, it's not just being popular, it's also being viable because right now a lot of people are trying to uh, make ends meet. They've lost their jobs uh, and a gig uh, economy has now been their primary livelihood. Um, do you think that it is possible to get cultural buy-in from people who are uh, not employees of the organizations they work for? Um, and, you know, in quite legal terms, they're contractors, uh, people like Food Panda and Grab and all the other stuff. So they're not, nearly, they're not really employees. So how do you manage that relationship between them trying to get a buy-in from organizations when they're not technically uh, employees? Okay. So... When they're not employees, it's a little harder because generally the reach is a little further. So under normal circumstances, they tend to not be within the organization physically. They tend to work uh, remotely. Sometimes they're within, right? So we did see that kind of hybrid. Now, clearly, everybody is virtual. Now, the thing is with the gig uh, employment uh, uh, take on right at this point and the contractors, as we call them, what they will need to feel is the experience uh, that they get when they interact with the organizations that they work with. And I think organizations need to invest. We should invest because these are people who are still working on our business objectives and imperatives. They are people who are still working on our outcomes. So the same level of attention and care should be given. Now, how do we do this? It is in how we display the value of the organization. 
We have codes of values, codes of conduct, we have behaviors, and we have traits. This needs to be exhibited very clearly. And th this is very important because these people who may not be our permanent employees are nonetheless within our, on our environment, our daily environment. And they become the informal ambassadors that take our good values and good practices and good behaviors out to the industry and out to the people they meet. And this is very powerful. So we understand the power of their interaction with us from an experienced perspective of what they see and feel and what they hear and know and how they are treated, treated and if they feel that they are actually inclusive and they are included in, in places and in means that they are able to, they will take this experience outside and it will speak very well and it will speak volumes of our organization. So this is how I feel we can actually involve those who are also not our employees, but nonetheless serving our greater objectives. How do you think organizations can continuously reward uh, employees in this environment? How do you think this will add to the culture of the organization? Especially, uh, Jasmine, in the context of what we spoke of earlier, which is uh, that they're not technically employees, so to speak. Okay. This is actually an area that um, I'm very passionate about. As things get harder, as we see a lot more constriction in the way we do business. And we, you know, when we look at it from a business standpoint, we're looking at margins and revenues shrinking. So how then do we continue to reward and recognize our people has become something I think all organizations are looking at. Now, again, be it whether they're permanent employees or they're contractors to us, I think what is important is we see where there's opportunity for us to involve them. Now, as we move through this pandemic and you know, we know better times are coming and we're gearing up for that, we're looking at our business strategies. We're looking at how we want to refocus. We want to, re we want to see how we're going to re even look at how we're going to manage um, our returns on investments and our returns on experience. We're looking at all of this. And oftentimes, it's only senior management who will be looking at all these strategies. It is high time to involve the workforce where possible to get them involved in how we shape and map that whole strategy and journey forward. It's important for simply because why we want more perspective and insights. We are always limited by what we know. And at senior management, we look at it very holistically. What you will get from people who are working on the job daily and those who are working at the line level is they will give you operational insights. They will also share their views and their perspectives. So you get a broader sense and a broader perspective of things. This is one huge way where employees will feel very involved and they feel that this is actually a recognition and a reward to them nonetheless. Now, in our global culture survey as well, we found that um, the uh, Malaysian respondents as well as the global respondents have told us that culture is clearly uh, a competitive advantage. They feel their cultures have been good and that's why they've been able to survive the pandemic. And very interestingly, 86% of Malaysian respondents say they want to continue to contribute by being upskilled and reskilled in the workforce. So people want to learn and they want to grow. So we need to open our perspective of how we reward and recognize. Involving them, one, of course, in the business objectives and imperatives and strategy is key. And the other thing is once we work together and we know what those imperatives are going to look like, it is good then to see how we can upskill and reskill them to be ready for the future. And this is the time that we can actually do that quite effectively. Right, we'll go for one short break. When we come back, we'll continue our conversation with PwC. Thanks for staying on with us. I have with me Jasmine Peters, the Director and Experience Consulting Lead of PwC Malaysia. Um, earlier on, Jasmine, we were talking about uh, your very interesting report uh, and uh, it talks about the Global Culture Survey um, of 2021 um, and it gives rise to how we have to take stock into how, operation, how uh, companies uh, move about their operations uh, towards the future. Um, studies have shown that uh, hybrid working uh, may be the new norm, uh, it may be here to stay. Um, how do you think this will shape team dynamics? Okay. The hybrid work that we are going through uh, now and in the future, that's going to be something that will definitely stay. And it, organizations that are able to carve out and manage that better will actually have a strong differentiator to market, especially when you look at bringing in talent and the retention of talent, right? 
So while many organizations and its people are yearning to go back to work, we are, you know, human beings, we want to be in an environment that's physical and actually meet people. We do also like the fact that we can work from home, right? But a blend of which would be nice. And I think different industries will look at different percentages of whether it's heavier on the virtual or heavier on the physical. Now, regardless, what uh, we have personally found has worked very well and how it has shaped our teams better is by respecting time and space, right? There's a strong tendency when it's virtual and now especially everyone's virtual is that we go into let's work uh, hour on hour, right? We just go on and on because you're sitting, you're not actually moving around or moving about, you're at home, you're quite basically, you're locked in. So what that what has then happened is we, we found that there's a lot of fatigue, mental fatigue, and people feel very stressed. And I think the other important thing, Brian, that has happened in this kind of environment is we forget that this, is, this has happened to us not so much by choice, right? But this has happened out of sheer necessity. And the challenge we noticed is not everyone is ready to work from home because they may not have a conducive setup to work from home, one. They're not just working from home alone. They're probably working at home with their spouses or their family members. And to add to that, they're probably also at home schooling with their children. And they may not have enough space or setup that is conducive. And this is where it's high time that we respect time and space. Oftentimes we just say work is work and your personal life is personal. Here it's entwined, clearly it's entwined, you know, we had one environment. So what we did in PWC quite quickly um, is to respect that nine to six are the working hours. We send no um, emails or even messages for that matter, or even phone calls before nine or after six. And this is the tone from the top, right? We set it from the top to say, this is how we work because we want to respect that there should be a demarcation. And this has really helped. How has it helped? I feel that suddenly we are a lot more efficient and effective because we realize that that's the time in which we must correspond and work with each other and collaborate. If we choose to work beyond those hours or earlier, that's choice. But it's important that we recognize that these are the working hours for meetings, for discussions. Miraculously, what we also found is that the one hour meetings suddenly become 45 minutes, half an hour. Now we look at 20, 15, 10. We learn to respect and be more focused. And I think what this has done is to build a stronger culture of professionalism. There's been a stronger approach to how we respect and trust each other at work. And I think most organizations, many organizations are going through the same kind of shift. And this is how I think it will shape team uh, dynamics better and stronger once we learn to respect the boundaries. The fact that technology has enabled and made all of this very possible for us some of the challenges that has been brought about uh, into how uh, companies stay productive is, of course, trying to stay relevant when it comes to uh, you know, community building, uh, learning across uh, employees. You know, I remember the time when I was uh, a junior uh, in a bank. You know, it was easy for me to just grab hold of a manager or a director, ask him or her opinion about a particular item, and then we are both on our way. You know, these kind of informal conversations can't happen, right, right now because of these um, either hybrid structure or, you know, working from home altogether. Uh, do you think that uh, the way um, the employees share uh, either technical knowledge or behavioral culture uh, knowledge is going to be tough moving forward? There will be some organizations that might find this tough. There might be those who are a lot more... Uh, ahead of the curve, right? So I think primary here is whether organizations have actually moved towards more collaborative platforms digitally. If they have, this will become, this is where they will accelerate how they actually collaborate and work with each other, sharing of information, right? Because now we have this kind of tools. But then again, these are heavy investments. And do we actually need to go into that layer of investments? The question is perhaps yes, but perhaps in little, uh, in smaller doses. But even before we go there, Ibrahim, I think organizations need to ask the very, very important question. How many people do we really, how many people does the workforce really need to be doing these kinds of jobs? I think that's the stock take that I, I said earlier as well that they need to take. And in terms of that, then what kind of correspondence levels would they actually need? So yes, it has shifted. We can't just walk over a desk or take the lift and go to another floor and ask somebody, you know, and you get the information you want, press to meet for lunch. And we, we can't really do that now. It will come to that again. But the moving forward, I think organizations will need to look at how we need to make those investments in technology where collaboration can happen either way. 
and digital connectivity is going to be primary and key to help us do that. Okay, Jasmine, final question. Uh, this pandemic seems to be here to stay. Uh, it seems like uh, we know that uh, while some countries, for instance, Israel, even though they've achieved over 76% adult um, vaccination rate uh, or anybody that, uh, that is above 17 uh, to have received a complete vaccination, they're still uh, going through a lot of tough time, even right now, because of the surge of the Delta variant. Uh, it's not going away. How do you think uh, companies need to be prepared uh, for such a pandemic to be a prolonged one, but more importantly, uh, pandemics like this is bound to happen again. How do you think organizations should be ready uh, to combat uh, such trials uh, and tribulations if it ever happens again uh, in the future? Yeah, I think God forbid that it will happen again in the future, but we do know the challenges are real. All of what you just said, Ibrahim, is extremely real. I think for one, we need to strengthen the way we actually communicate with each other in an organization. And to understand that the shifts of what we will need to be doing is going to be something that's going to be very real. By shifts, I mean we may be able to come back to work and just before we can say, you know, you know, hooray, we probably need to probably go back again to a lockdown or to some form of hybrid. So that's going to happen. I think we need to be able to let our people know, organizations need to communicate this, the dexterity and the agility and the nimbleness of how we we'll want to function. Right? And to really then say what is going to be key for us to look at and do. A lot of layers need to be cut out. A lot of hierarchy and bureaucracy are things we need to cut out. The red tape of how we function uh, traditionally or typically needs to be re-looked at because that actually just weighs us down and it shortens, it, it just extends the time in which we do and it shortens the focus on important things. So this is something we need to start looking at very quickly because if this hits, and as I said earlier, technology, um, investments will need to be made but that's heavy right? not all organizations want to go out and make such heavy investments so while that is something that we think about and we will do what can we do immediately and that is to cut out all the unessential aspects or aspects which we think are necessary but they are actually just legacy processes or legacy issues that are weighing us down so that's a huge thing that we need to uh, start looking at and cutting down immediately the second thing is to prepare the workforce that they need to be nimble enough to be to be uh, resilient right? and to take the moves and the changes as they come. So I think these are one of the uh, two of the key things. And I think leadership needs to be a lot more in touch with its people. Meaning we, as I said, we cut the layers in terms of work processes and systems, but we also need to have more direct conversations with our people and to be more inclusive in how we actually deal with the future. And it's really good for leadership to say, we don't actually know all the answers. I think that's fine. So a little humility, some resilience, Thanks, Jasmine. That was Jasmine Peters, the Director and Experience Consulting Lead at PwC Malaysia. If you've missed any part of this show, just head on to Astro Awani. Look for Notepad over there. You can also look for PwC as well. Until then, thanks very much for watching. Goodbye.